All right, um, so uh, we are all set now. Um, um, so my name is Jukka Birtila, I'm from University of Helsinki. I'm also uh, part of the UNU wider network. So I'm, um, I was very pleased to, um, uh, uh, to, uh, to be asked to, um, to, to comment on this excellent report by, which was so well presented here. So um, I think, I mean, tax economists uh, um, and, and many other uh, tax practitioners had long the view that the, I mean, when we started to think about international tax, it was sort of um, depressing because on the other hand, um, there were very few instruments to, um, uh, to uh, target those rich individuals uh, who are, 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 are using tax havens to uh, evade taxes. On the other hand, we also knew that uh, uh, international uh, uh, corporate income taxation is plagued by uh, profit shifting and, and the tax competition. So it was a depressing, depressing picture, really. So that started to change, really, when it comes to the individual side. Uh, first, uh, less than 10 years ago, with, with the onset of these in information exchange agreements. So now, uh, tax authorities know way better uh, than, than beforehand. Uh, about foreign incomes of individuals. Um, but the corporate income tax competition and, 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 and transfer pricing um, uh, uh, problem remained. But here now, this uh, two-pillar approach is the very first step to a major change to the, co to the international corporate income tax structure that is hopefully now going to um, st start to remedy the situation that we had, have had uh, with the tax rates declining and, and, and profits being shifted. So this is, a, this is big in the, in the area of, of taxation. Uh, and, and this report really uh, is an excellent addition uh, to, the, to, to the analysis of, of some of the implications of this major reform. So I think that we can congratulate UNCTAD for making a, a very good service to the profession. Of, uh, profession on providing this, uh, this uh, very meticulous, uh, uh, comprehensive analysis. And especially the revenue estimations that come from this uh, granular country-by-country country reporting data are, are especially valuable. So some of the key findings uh, uh, from, the, from the report uh, is that the, um, uh, are the following. So the revenue gains for developing countries could be substantial. They are not automatic. They re require implementation. Um, uh, so then um, this additional in, uh, income uh, or, 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 or tax revenue that's generated by the minimum tax uh, either goes to the, um, to, 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 the, uh, to the country where, where, where the owners of these multinationals are located, typically in the north, or then they, they go to the, uh, uh, to the, to the uh, host country in the, in the global south. So uh, clearly, I mean, Making a decision on, on, on who, who gets this revenue is, is an important one. But the striking feature of this report really is that it's even more important what happens via this indirect effect of curbing profit shifting. So that doesn't mean that countries in the, in the global south shouldn't, affect, shouldn't try to grab the revenue itself mechanically, uh, but that's only part of the story. There could be because tax rates are going up, there could be a small negative impact on the overall investment level, uh, uh, but on the other hand, then the, uh, uh, then the allocation impacts could be even greater, and the non-haven countries are all set to gain. Uh, and as I already said, um, this is not far from clear because it requires implementation. This comes fast, this comes on top of the existing uh, regulation, so, so this needs attention now. Uh, let me comment on some of the things uh, regarding the uh, actual pillar two before we before I go on to the um, uh, to the to the analysis in the paper and then I conclude. So um, I understand that this 15% is a compromise, and and but you can academically ask, I mean, uh, what the actual rate should be, and there's actual interesting analysis by Hebu and Keen who show that even for the low income tax. Uh, low, low tax country in a, in a, in a, in, in a uh, 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 
joint equilibrium where, where countries collaborate, uh, the, the Pareto improving uh, tax rate could even go, go, go beyond the 15 percent. So it's not, so, uh, so the 15 percent, it's, it's unlikely to hurt them and we could go even further. So it would be interesting to know, is, the, is this just a start? So, and is the discussion of further increases coming up? Uh, how about then the uh, still a relatively large firms which are in the category, let's, let, let's say more than 500 million. Um, uh, 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 could be perhaps lower the threshold as well. And, and then there are some peculiarities which I don't completely understand. So, so this minimum tax affects quite a bit of the tax incentives, but not all. So those that are, uh, that are like transfers to, um, uh, to firms are still allowed. And I'm, I'm a little bit uncertain, I mean, I mean why, why is that allowance still, still there? But of course, this is nothing to do with the report, but this is just a, a, some commentary on the, on the contents of the, of the, of the second pillar. Um, so uh, there are also, in, in implementation, there are potential pitfalls. So first of all, uh, the tax base is not the same as the corporate book profits, because the tax base is the corporate book profits minus the so-called carve-out. And the carve-out is an allowance for, uh, uh, for things like some uh, um, uh, payroll expenditure, etc. So the idea is that this minimum tax would then be akin to a, to a, to a rent tax. Uh, uh, of course, I mean, if the carve-out is extremely large, then there's a very narrow base, so this is going to be crucial. I'm not certain, I mean, how the carve-out will be calculated. Are there risks that firms I, uh, can manipulate so that they, they, would be, they would be including some maybe cover taxes or some expenditures that shouldn't be there? Uh, Relabeling expenses, I don't know if that's a concern. Uh, and finally, something that was not mentioned in the report at all is incidents. So the corporations actually don't pay the tax. It's either the corporate owners, their workers, or the customers who pay the tax. There's evidence from developed countries that the corporate income tax incidence is actually quite a lot on the workers. Is there a concern that these larger effective tax rates would actually harmfully impact the earnings of those who work in the, for, for these comp comp companies. So this is something that was, was not mentioned, but something that we should be aware of, that this, this could be something that the, uh, uh, is relevant. Very small comments on the actual analysis. I, I really like that, and, and I, uh, these, are, these are small uh, nitty-gritty points. Um, um, uh, maybe the main one is that the um, uh, Elsewhere in the report, there's discussion on how widespread these, um, um, these tax incentives for corporate income tax are. So then I was surprised to see that the, that, the, that the difference between the statutory rate and the effective rate was actually not that large. Um, so colleagues of mine from UU Wider, they did a paper on Uganda MNEs, or those multinational companies that are located in Uganda. And they've found strikingly that because of all tax holidays that Uganda has given, Multinational companies in the country face 20 percentage points lower effective tax rate than domestic firms do. And there's anecdotal evidence that this is this is not a Uganda-specific story. This is this is something that is 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 is, is, in, is, is, is the fact uh, pro probably many other sub-Saharan African countries. So against this backdrop, I found that the effective tax rates are perhaps. Uh, uh, surprisingly large uh, uh, or high, and then there could be more comments on the coverage of country-by-country country reporting on, the, on, the, on, on which these are based. Uh, uh, I skipped the final bullet there. So um, finally, let me comment on the monitoring and evaluation, because we are, many of here are researchers. Uh, so um, first of all, uh, because this comes so fast, it would be interesting to see to know, I mean, how, how the implement, implementation is progressing, especially uh, whether countries are adopting this rule, uh, which, and this d difficult acronym is the rule for, uh, which says that the, then, then the developing country host uh, uh, countries would get the revenue. So they should be adopting this rule. I, mean, I don't know what the progress there is. 
when it comes to research and looking at how the previous policy actions that are taken to curb profit shifting via the PEPS process have actually worked in developing countries, that research space is extremely thin. So uh, it would be very interesting now to, I mean, scale up that research activities on the in existing policies and, 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 and I completely agree that the, uh, there's a need for now increased technical assistance for, for developing countries to, to manage all this. And maybe there could be also benefits of combining research activities on some of this technical assistance. Because if the research teams co collaborate early on with the technical capacity people, we could perhaps monitor the implementation and early on take corrective action if, if things are not, pro not, not progressing as they should. Um, so I, let me end there and then I'll hand over to the other discussion. So thank you.